Welcome to The Interlocutor with me, Anthony Anaxagoru. Today I'm joined by Nikesh Shukla, writer, editor, footballer, trampolinist. <laughs> <laughs> Not them things. Um, and most of all, the, the editor of The Good Immigrant, which is a fantastic collection of essays by 21 writers of colour that deals with all kinds of social issues. Uh, Nikesh, hello and welcome. Hi, how's it going? Not too bad, thanks very much. We're very warmer on the, in, the, in, in an office building somewhere in central London. I'm not too sure where. I think this is a literary agency. Yeah, right? it's my, uh, my film and TV agent, David oh, okay. Hyam. Right. Um, this is obviously, like, there's, the sun is shining through these really massive windows the sun is shining through these really massive windows and obviously it's like a greenhouse yeah, in yeah here. it's very warm me and Nikesh are both sweating profusely yeah and I know that I'm wearing a white t-shirt underneath a black jumper and I don't want to take my black jumper off yeah, because yeah. I don't want to expose you to the sweat patches of doom I've got to the gym I've seen it all um, so <laughs> uh, let, let's can I just yes. before we start yeah yeah am I allowed to swear absolutely okay cool because yeah. I've got a really bad habit of swearing quite collo- like, not collo- but quite informally yeah, informally and that's all good man like, I think we're, we've are we we've passed the test to show that we can use language in various ways so once you do that you can start swearing as much as you want um, so I want to talk a bit about The Good Immigrant to begin with what was the inspiration and the ideas behind it um, it kind of happened by accident like I'm a writer um but I'm a writer of colour, and so when you're a writer of colour, you often the only time you're really asked to do events is uh, to sit on diversity panels where everyone sits down and moans about how there isn't enough ide- uh, diversity in the arts. And most of the time, all of the people of colour in that room are going, we know this. And all of the other people in the room are like, well, by talking about it, that's kind of us acknowledging that it's a problem without really doing anything about it. And I was doing a, I was doing a diversity panel in like, when was it, mid-2015, summer 2015, and it was quite a big event. And I was sitting, listening to um, a, a literary editor list off... Um, every single writer of colour that her publisher had ever published in the entire history of that publisher Mm. like it was helpful and I had this flashback to five years before that and I'd been sitting on um, a diversity panel at London Book Fair um, and I was saying nothing different than I was saying five years ago and then I remembered in that moment I was really like my head was not in this diversity panel Um, and in that moment I remembered five years before sitting at at this diversity panel feeling really optimistic because a year before I'd been to like a networking event of loads of people of colour in the publishing industry and everyone was really excited that that change was going to come and so six or so years later um, nothing had changed and I was like you know before even that networking event where everyone felt hopeful there'd already been like loads and loads of problems and so nothing was changing and I got I know I was getting really annoyed by it and I was getting really annoyed by being asked to do diversity panels instead of being asked to do panels where I talk about writing or comedic writing or what have you. Um, and then just after that, I did uh, I did some writing tips for The Guardian. A lovely journalist called Huma phoned me and four or five other writers and we gave her some writing tips. And they're all about like how... Um, how do you know when your work is finished? That kind of thing. That was the focus of the article. Not very controversial, right? Yeah. Turns out it was quite controversial because the first comment in on the piece from quite a prominent author was going, why have all these people been interviewed and not anyone more famous? I suppose they're all Asian, just like the journalists, so they're oh, probably wow. all just her mate. And that was the first time that I'd noticed that they're all Asian. It just, you know, it obviously just felt quite normal to me. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I thought, well, this is exactly the problem, like, we you know when we get these opportunities it's never because of merit it's yeah. never because our writing's brilliant it's because of tokenism or diversity Tick or, a box. or ticking a box yeah. or we know someone which you know given how small the industry is everyone knows someone and that's how you do advance mm. you know there is an old boys network and um and i just thought i'm just done justifying my seat at the table it's exhausting and then over the summer, I read um, Between the World and Me by Tanahasi mm. Coates and Citizen by Claudia Rankin. And they're both amazing books. And I 
thought it would be really amazing to have a UK version of this. And then I was like, well, publishing's kind of slow. I don't know when it would come out. Uh, and then Musa Okwonga was on Twitter talking about like this idea of the good immigrant, you know, where you kind of you start off from this default position of being a bad immigrant and you're here in the UK to steal jobs or mm. steal women or steal places at GP waiting rooms. And um, and then you do something in the public eye to transcend, like Mo Farah won an Olympic gold or like Nadia Hussain won the Great British Bake Off and then you become a good immigrant. And I just tweeted back to him, I would totally read a collection of essays called The Good Immigrant. <laughs> right, that was it. Yeah, and Musa was like, well, why don't you do it? And then I was like, yeah, yeah, why don't I? And then he DM'd me later on and he was like, uh, you remind me of that Chinua Achebe quote, if you don't like someone's story, write your own. Mm. And I was like, well, why don't I? And then I was, I was like, oh, it would, just, it would take ages and I'll just lose any patience and it'll sell like 50 copies. Mm. What's the point? It's a lot of energy. Um, but I had I had uh, met a very, very nice person called Rachel Kerr. Mm earlier that year at a conference and she used to work at like quite a big publisher she's like she's got decades of experience and she run she co-runs this new publisher called unbound and unbound it basically runs like a standard bog standard publisher so like they have like an editorial department they have a publicity team they have a sales and marketing team distribution all that kind of stuff but what they do to ensure that the book doesn't lose money or the book makes money from the, it is in profit from the second it comes out. Um, they do crowdfunding to, to fund for things like the co- printing costs and like the publicity budget and all that kind of stuff. And um, books can come out quite quickly depending on how quickly they're funded. And um, it can be quite reactive as well. And so, and she and I had been talking about trying to find a project to work on together. And she was really adamant that we do something to like, um, do like do something in publishing and I was thinking well what can I do agents always say they don't know where all the talent is and publishers say the agents don't send them the books and then so on and so forth and it just goes round and round in a circle maybe I can disrupt the circle by identifying 20 writers that I know that I really like or 20 writers that I really rate online and do this collection that Mm. Moosha and I kind of joked about Uh, and so I spoke to her and she was really up for it and we did it and like it has surpassed all of our expectations at every, at every single turn. It's been, like, ridiculous. Yeah. It's been really amazing. Like, my worry is that it just becomes that book that people are like, oh, diversity done, box yeah, ticked. Right. But my- that, that was going to be one of the things that I was going to kind of touch on, was, was that idea of once diversity stops being the current buzzword, what happens then? Do you think it's going to go back to being as it was in the kind of re- representation of writers of colour in comparison to white writers? Or do you think that this is actually going to cement something in the long term? I don't know is the answer. And I, I like I don't want to overstate my role in any of mm. this. Like, I've been very vocal, but, like, there's loads of people putting in work. And so I think, you know, there's some interesting th- initiatives happening at publishers. Um, I think there is an awareness that stuff has to change. And, and you're right. It can be quite short-term change, but I think the thing that uh, the thing that people are like writers are definitely saying now is like diversity initiatives initiatives don't work unless there's some sort of long-term um, cultural change, mm. and so like you have these interesting things where a major publisher is trying to diversify its senior management team, which I think is often where the problem is. Like the people who make the decisions about what gets published and what doesn't get yeah. published, like. What you tend to see is like at the grassroots level, currently, I'm not, I can't speak for previous years, but it sort of feels to me at the moment, like at like the entry level, it's very diverse, mm. but then it kind of filters out. Something as, happens um, further on up the line. Yeah. yeah, like what and what I imagine happens is people don't advance and they get pissed off and they leave. And is that is that the fault of the gatekeepers? When we, when we think about agents, when we think about publishers, when we think about the editors and the people that say, yes, we're going to invest time and money in putting this story and this novel out there, are those the people who should be held accountable? I th- yeah, I think gatekeepers are definitely the people who are making decisions about what gets published. And um, if those gatekeepers aren't, diverse if those gatekeepers um can't spot 
a normalized story told by a person of color because often you need like often you need to either be from that background or like at least understand that background um then those books don't get through mm. and it's a crying shame you just have to look at the statistics like own it which is a publisher run by the amazing crystal mayhe morgan like they were the only pub and that is a uh, like a publisher like a new type of story like uh, I don't think she ever even refers to it as a publisher it's like uh, digital it's like a digital age kind of pushing things into a new new era new yeah it's, it's interesting what she's doing there and she like it like last year in 2016 she published the only debut by a black British male mm. of, um, Robin Travis's book and this uh, this year she's going to do J.J. Bowler's yeah. book as well and that's that is astounding to me like if say 165,000 books were put out in 2016 um, then and only one of them was a debut like and the part that so much of the focusing in focus in the industry is on like exciting debuts yeah. and only one of those was by quite a significant demographic then that that's kind of weird mm. um, I've been on and, I've been on panels that have kind of you know they've played devil's advocate with me and they've kind of said things like quite incendiary comments in the sense of the reason why that is is because the writing of writers of color is not as sophisticated as the book as the white middle classes and this is what they kind of they that, try and say but and then really you know, that, racist. that's ridiculously racist and that's <laughs> said openly in public by people that have got big platforms and like it goes back to the idea of the gatekeepers if this is what is being thought of and these are the sentiments that are being harboured by these particular people and it comes as no surprise really and how well informed are they of the whole milieu or, or are they just kind of focused around the little cohort of writers that they trust that talk about an experience that is that resonates with them as opposed to you know we think of Lionel Shriver when she said the thing about um, hope that cultural appropriation the whole discussion around it is a fad and it passes and it's this what are your thoughts on on what she was said last September in Australia I thought I thought she completely belittled <laughs> the entire point about the conversation by being belligerent by belligerently from a position of privilege having been a nice accident that's a beautiful sound. <laughs> that was well. I think Lionel Shriver she is it. in the building. Yeah, yeah. Um, her helicopter is hovering. Probably she in can, the toilet. Up yeah, because she can. She can afford a helicopter. Yeah, look, yeah. look. Sorry, look, <laughs> look. Um, the the thing is, like, she can she can say that from a position of privilege because she's never had to struggle to get published, right. and the fact that she wants to write whatever she wants is fine but it you know and that is something she has to own but it's really selfish mm. to then go to not put herself in the position of like um a writer who's really struggling like i don't i i've been fortunate enough to be published twice like two novels and like I, i've done okay i'm like and i feel like i've been lucky um you know my <laughs> you know i look back at my first novel and i go oh i, I wish i could rewrite it and all that kind of stuff like as writers who are growing mm. all the time do um, but I feel like when I was coming up, there were a couple of people who really, really mentored me and really like put like put themselves out there for me, like Niven Govindan and Selena God Godden, and like without them, I wouldn't be here. Mm. And I sort of feel like the Good Immigrant and like some of the other stuff I've done has you know given me a small platform, and it would be selfish of me to just use it for my own advantage. Like I think it's important to bring people through. Absolutely, I so think when. Could, so could, could could someone argue in a sense and this is again something that i've heard being banded around these panels is that what we're looking for is essentially a power shift as opposed to equality um, and we want to be the people in control the people putting out the stories that we like that talk to us is there the danger that that could happen say in 10 15 years time where more writers of colour set up their own publishing houses, which is what's happening now, especially within poetry. Um, there's a lot of independent presses that publish really important writing, really good writing and important writing. But across the whole board, with fiction and, and all the other different genres, do you think that that is something that could happen? The, a power shift? Mm. 
This is <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. We're in the building site, basically. <laughs> um, so the thing is, I don't, I don't know. I think what what is really, really important to to recognise is that there is space for all of these voices. I think that is the crucial thing. I think there is this assumption that there's only a certain amount of slots mm. and a certain amount of people get those, are prioritised for those slots. And the thing is, you know, I, so I go back to like, so going back to the good immigrant and um, my kind of feelings around it, um, I was always told that um, people don't buy books by writers of colour. Like they just don't sell. And, at the time I was like, so basically you're saying my skin colour is a marketing trend mm. and you're also saying my skin colour is a not very lucrative marketing trend. Mm. That's doubly insulting. Mm. Um, and so for that book to be crowdfunded in three days before a word of it had even been written, I think makes the point that it um, there there is a readership. So I think we kind of proved the point that there is a there is a readership there so if the readership is there what what are we doing to attract that readership part of attracting that readership is putting out the books that they want to read mm. and so th i mean this is the thing and i think maybe there is this a general point to be made now about how i don't really feel like anyone can get away with saying that there is such a thing as a mainstream audience yeah. I feel like there are lots of different audiences out there and you either have to be able to be able to have an agile marketing scheme that can attract lots of different audiences or just service those audiences, especially the audiences who have been so criminally underrepresented yeah. for, for decades and decades and decades. Do you feel that within the term diversity, is something that I've often thought about, you know, we think of diversity and we have a particular, particularly in the... Um, the way that it's used in publishing is it and within the arts in general but do you think that it's it's a it's kind of a privileged term in the sense of it's usually privileged groups of people saying we want diversity now and we're going to accept you on the condition that you adhere to our dictums uh, and you kind of still work within the remits that we that we send so it's still quite exclusionary but in a very in a much more subtle way yeah, I do. I I think it's it's a difficult term. I I I don't like it as a word at the moment because it still feels like hey, we're celebrating your otherness. Right. Whereas, um, in I feel like inclusion or representation are probably closer to what I want because, um, a working class editor who then commissions a working class writer to put out a book, whatever it's about, it might be about space monkeys or what have you. Um, that isn't diversity that is someone like that is someone commissioning someone in their own image so like what we ne actually need is a diversification of the gatekeepers yeah. rather than a diversification of the writers because the writers are out there yeah i mean that's that's exactly the, the kind of point that i was saying at the beginning was the issue with the gatekeepers and that's why for me that's who i really hold responsible for this thing and then when you get like i think it was was it was it you that did the the report about the CEOs and the people at the top of these big publishing houses and their demographic and things like that it was mainly all white middle class men that were at the helm of these big publishing houses and they get the kind of final say in what goes out and what stays in. Um, and I think that in itself is quite problematic to be at the whims of someone to someone like that. The other thing that I wanted to kind of just touch on is particularly in poetry, I don't know if it's the same in fiction or well, the fiction that I've read kind of suggests this, that when you are a writer of colour, it is almost like obligatory to write about race. You have to, you can't ever steer away from writing about identity, race, gender, anything along the identitarian lines. Whereas a white writer is free to explore any concept that they wish to choose. And I think with poetry, this is particularly true in that the, the options are so vast with regards to poetics. But whereas when you're writing as a writer of colour, a lot of the the work has to be centered around who am i and why do i feel like this i would put it to you that may i what i would say that that maybe the privilege of being a white writer is not having your work interrogated as being about race it's interrogated as the default the mm. norm whereas 
me wrestling with questions um race will come up and you know it's it's it's, it's interesting so two projects that I've worked on, uh, one, my second novel, Meet Space, which is like about our online identities. Um, race does come up every now and then because the characters are of colour, um, but it's not central to the to the plot. But when it was, I'm, I saw a review somewhere where it said it interrogated like how people of colour are online. I was like, no, it just interrogates how people are. But mm. because... Because... Because it was you. Because yeah, it was me. Right. So like people, people do put that onto you. Mm. And um, the other thing is, like, I wrote um, I wrote a script. Uh, I was quite public about this, uh, like, and the, the producers were like, um, the producer. I wrote a sitcom about a thing. I'm not going to say what it was about because something that has an all white cast has just been commissioned, right. which pretty much has the same setup. Probably a better script by a better writer. That's by the by. But my script had an all Asian cast um, dealing with something that had happened that was nothing to do with their race and um, a broadcaster rejected it and the only feedback that they gave us wasn't anything to do with whether it was funny whether the setup was interesting which it was because it turns out you know this this person has had this commission this week but they didn't know how to sell a script feature a sitcom featuring an all asian cast um internationally because no one in russia would really identify with an asian and i thought you've turned this into a race thing yeah, right. I haven't yeah. I've written about like what was it like five five people who are Asian because they are the characters I wanted to use to tell this story but because your default is white mm. you've made this a race thing yeah. whereas I've just written five characters absolutely and I, that, that's a kind of a, a grievance that I've heard from a lot of writers of colour who have just actually tried to write a character whereas somebody usually a white um, kind of editor or someone along these lines tries to spin it and see uh, what are they what what race are they and and the, uh, the idea is why does it matter they're having a human experience why do we have to try and straight away put them in to some kind of racial context that's, what's, what's yeah. sorry i was just going to say uh, there's a book that's just come out by Britt bennett called the mothers where every character they their race is never described unless they're white. Mm. So the aut- the automatic as- assumption is that they're all black, mm. um, or that well they are all black. I haven't read the book, but I, I read this somewhere that that this author had done this, and I've been doing the same thing with my book because I I want to flip what nor- with norm a normal a normalization are problematic words. I I I, I recognize that, but I want to kind of flip what the default is. Yeah. I think yeah, and those are the important things because obviously a lot of people understand how stories inform our opinions of each other. But they, but so much more than that, they inform our aspirations. Like, I mean, do you talk publicly about having a kid? No, no. But I mean, we can. I mean, I have a kid, but yeah, it's not something that. Well, I just think about like my kid Mm -hmm. and like how I've curated a a bookshelf for her that features positive uh, representation of people of colour, people with disabilities, mm. people in non-traditional family setups, etc. And uh, because that is normal for me, so it needs to be normal for her. And you kind of need to show her that it's normal. Whereas if she just read, um, you know, what was that? Marley Diaz, who's that 11-year-old girl who, who did that yeah. campaign around a thousand Batgirl books where she was she was really sick of a boy and, boy and his dog yeah, going yeah. on an adventure. Um, and then like, and yeah... And then my my kid like her favorite book for a month was Dogger mm. and like that really pained me because it was just a boy and his dog, dog book, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where like his fluff, fluffy fluffy pet uh, like fluffy toy dog. But um, how about the accolades? I'm, I'm, you, you tweeted today. You, you did a piece for the bookseller, right, about the Carnegie Awards and things like that, and the lack of representation within prestigious awards as well. Yeah, I I, I was I was just pissed off on Twitter about it because mm. um, the. Um, the 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 what was nominated for the list was was very diverse and there's been great some great uh, books by writers of color for children and for teenagers this year and none of them made the long list and like a black person hasn't won the prize in like 17 years i can't remember the exact s- statistic um and in defending an all white, another all white list, which had a very diverse nomination procedure, um, the head of 
the organization that runs the prize said that each book was judged on an equal playing field mm. and that for me is a really problematically loaded term because we know and it's very well established that publishing isn't an equal playing field so then to say that books can be judged on equal playing field is it's offensive mm. um and like true true diversity for me or true inclusion for me isn't necessarily um isn't necessarily having like say a prize list where you have to have a person of color or a person with a disability or a working class writer because that's like you and you have to that that has to be the case like that because that's tokenism mm. what i want is for every writer to feel like they've had equal access opportunity encouragement confidence and um publish publishing record to be able to be entered into that prize yeah. and then the judges who are um as representative of the books that are submitted as possible then get to choose what the best book is because yeah. like ultimately when when we talk about the best books we only publish the best books that doesn't mean anything yeah. until we have and it's the best books according to who you know well exactly so you know you have four or five judges the bu uh, best books published by who according um, according, a, to who. according to who yeah. like Tedrick Cole's bio is like his Twitter bio just says we who and yeah. I, I know I feel like yeah. that that says it all that's everything me. yeah it sums it all up what are your thoughts on the DIY culture I know this is a term a new term that's been kind of put around was an old term it's an old term it must be new to me but um, just the idea that people now again with publishing houses a lot of poets particularly are um, self-publishing so they're not really relying on publishing houses to get out there um, what are your thoughts on that do you think that's a an encouraging and a positive way to go or do you think we should try and bring it back in and get some kind of change going within the big publishing houses I w well I would like across the board for there to be like access and opportunities for everyone because like mainstream publishing isn't for everyone for some people it's like the ultimate dream for other people like they're much more comfortable in the space where they do it themselves mm. um, and I, th I think we're in a really exciting time in terms of like independent and small presses and people doing stuff themselves um, where they know they have an audience they know they have the ability to use the internet properly to find that audience and to like do what they need to get their stuff out there um, and whether they even need like mainstream publishers like ultimately it's down to the writer to feel like what's best for them yeah. like um, a friend of mine uh, well Mr G um, once told me when we were sitting in a coffee shop like years and years ago and I bet he probably doesn't even remember he said this but it's really it's stayed with me because um, I, I think at the time I was moaning to him about how I didn't have a literary agent and it was really frustrating and he said why do you need an agent and I was like well to get a publishing deal and I was like he was like um, you only need an agent to make the phone calls you can't make mm. At the time, people made more phone calls and sent fewer emails, yeah. obviously. But um, and that really stuck with me. This idea that like there are certain projects where I can do the majority of the work and it will do all right, and there are certain projects where like writing a novel is quite a complex thing, and I need someone external to be able to help, help me, the help, idea, me yeah. help me like because you know when you're invested invested in like eighty to ninety thousand words worth of text, it's impossible to see where the weak points are or, sure. um but something like the good immigrant like it felt like quite a diy project and it felt like a, a family joint mm. because like they so, were friends of yours right everyone who kind of got involved in that people that you knew not not right? everyone like i knew there were i think i i followed them all online right. and like some of them are people I, i'm really close to and some of them are people who i really rate and some of them are just people who i'd seen on, online and was like you're really interesting mm. so it was, it was like i didn't think too much about curating it and actually like the 20 people who did it aren't the only people i asked sorry guys if you're listening <laughs> i didn't ask more people but some people either didn't have time or the inclination to to um to do it or they didn't have a thing they wanted to write about at that point um, what uh, what books would you recommend to to people listening to people who subscribe to the podcast? Like re books that you recommend by writers of color. 
that you feel are crucial that people need to know about that maybe they don't know about? Oh man! Off the top of your head, that's a big one, Nikos. It is a big one. I, just, I have to treat the this. refugees. I saw you tweet the refugees yesterday. And I oh would have looked it up, man. God. Yeah, yeah. Oh my like an epic God! Yeah. It's so good. It's. You know a good short story writer when like you feel like every word has been thought about. Um, is I haven't finished it. I'm I'm trying to take it slowly because because reading reading short stories and reading poetry, I find I have to, I can't binge on it. I can really binge on novels, but I I read I read quite quickly. Yeah. So like it's good to have something that forces you to slow down and luxuriate yeah. in the language. I I really love that book. I'm only like four stories into it. Um, there's there's a short story collection by ZZ Packer called Drinking Coffee Elsewhere, which is a life changing collection of short stories. It really it really deserves much more kudos in the UK. Um, like it's a really seminal book in the US, but like in the UK it was put out and kind of forgotten about. And um, it's just like 12 really perfect short stories um, by an incredible writer who I wish he wrote more mm. um, I really love I, I like quite short books I've I've no, I've, I've come to realise um, have you always liked short books or is that a new new thing I think um, the the amount of the amount of, like I, I'm re in a really lucky position in the last like three or four years where like I come home and like there's packages of books waiting for me that people just sent right. which is really nice yeah. that's the dream yeah. um, and so um, like having that seven ninety nine or that six ninety nine to spend on a book like and making sure it's the right choice yeah. um, I think like now I have much more choice in what what to read I find like I tend to go for the shorter things but um, and I read a lot of contemporary fiction because um, I like to know what how people are writing now um, and so uh, Family Life by Akio Sharma is one of the best books it came out like two or three years ago but and it's quickly become one of my favourite books of all time mm -hmm. I've reread it three or four times it's just a, an astonishing um, story about a really dysfunctional family and depression and alcoholism and um, and disability and it's brilliant um, Han Kang is really interesting as well. She, she's she's had two novels out, The Vegetarian yeah, yeah, and yeah. which is the weirdest yeah, book yeah, I've ever yeah. read, but brilliant. And Human Acts, which is more, much more political, um, but she's really interesting. Um, what about any for kids that you could recommend for parents who, who want to kind of read books that aren't about one blonde-haired, blue-eyed kid in his. <laughs> Um, Nadia Shireen uh, has a couple of picture books out called The Bumble Bear and um, Shit, Big Bad Wolf, mm. which uh, she, she's she got a really joyous sense of humour um, and I really enjoy them. Um, I Oliver Jeffers uh, is, is someone I would... I would exercise caution around reading his stuff because he, his, uh, his, you know, you know, when you see a really good animation that has as many themes and jokes for the adults as well as for the kids, mm. his books, like if you're reading it as an adult, it's on a whole other level. Like there's a book called The Heart Shaped Bottle about um, basically about a grieving girl who loses her granddad and puts her heart in a bottle mm. and then just can't love again. And it's just, I can't read it without like bawling all the right. way through it. Um, I'm also re I've I've been reading a lot more teen fiction in the last few years because I I do a lot of youth work and I work with young people. I run a youth magazine called Rife, um, where I mentor young people to create content for this magazine and um, just talking to them about the stuff that they were reading and like them really really challenging me in terms of like the stuff that I wanted to write about. I I started to feel like I really wanted to write for teenagers, but I feel like you can't suddenly decide you want to write for an audience that you've not read as like for an audience you're not a reader of yeah. so I started reading a lot of YA kind of just to just to sort of see what was out there and it's interesting I spoke to Stephen Camden we recorded an interview with him um, a few days ago and he was saying again I asked him the same question how do you write for teenagers and he was just like you don't like you don't see it as he said the word teenager is relatively new so he goes that whole idea 
is quite stifling. So he kind of just sees it as I'm going to write a story or a story that I would like to read. Yeah. And he kind of thinks that's the recipe. Like if you can get all those things put in place, you can write quite a compelling tale. Yeah. Um, I, and that was, that was um, the thing I learned was um, you can thematically deal with the same stuff you want to deal with as an adult, but through the eyes of a teenager yeah. rather, rather than through the eyes of like someone in their thirties mm. or what have you. Um, and so I've written, I've written a book for teenagers, which I'm hoping to have some news that I can share publicly soon about, which is really exciting. Um, and I really, I really see my future kind of going forward as sort of doing a, doing a novel and then doing like doing a novel featuring adult characters and then doing a novel featuring teenage, teenage characters teenage, and then yeah. like flipping between the two. Um, I was, I was, I, I've never read much David Mitchell, um, but I appreciated that in his last book, the no second to last book, the Bone Clocks, he had sort of created this omniverse mm. where all the characters from through all his novels kind of came, came together, together yeah. and that's like I, you know how like Marvel is just taking over everything and yeah. they're sort of building this really consistent and coherent universe yeah. I sort of want to do that yeah. it's, it's, I sort it's, of want it's to it's be like idea. the arrogant author who's like I'll just create my own universe yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well it's a bit like when um, uh, J.R. Tolkien started writing his own dictionary he's like inventing words and had a dictionary within a dictionary and all this yeah I mean you can get really you need a headspace for that I think and um it's a, it's quite an endeavour to do that, pull it off properly. Finally, what um, what are you working on at the moment? I'm, you're putting together a collection of essays for young, young writers of colour, right? Where you're asking them to well, write about just young writers. Just young writers, in general. yeah. Right. I'm I'm trying that thing I was saying to you about earlier, like true diversity is like making the the call out yeah. to everyone, everyone yeah, and yeah. then seeing what you get. And actually, it's like it's a really diverse group of under twenty five, under yeah, under twenty four, under twenty four. Right. Uh, so yeah. Um, while I've been working on this magazine on on Rife and mentoring these young people and like seeing like how they've really responded to the good immigrant and have said like imagine we did that this for young people and then like that idea got floated with by my boss mm. well, why don't we do an essay book for young people um because it's like the thing I would say about the good immigrant is it's not a political manifesto it's not meant to be an exhaustive an exhaustive set of all experiences that represents all communities ever it's yeah. a, it's 21 essays by 21 writers who are of color mm. um and you know like some of the essays disagree with each other some of the essays are at odds with each other uh, and etc and that was really important to kind of show the plurality Paradox, yeah, yeah. the plurality and nuance mm. that sometimes people of color disagree with each other or sometimes they can come to the same experience um from different places and they are quite subjective experiences yeah as well, so yeah of that. course and the, and they're pieces of literature as well um in the same way that you read like I, I, the same way i read um the bit of suburbia and saw myself as a version of kareem amir mm. even though like my life was quite different to his um i was a lot less brave i think um so but with the good immig uh, with the the book that we're doing with rife like we kind of felt like we wanted to be a bit more political because uh, and that was a steer from the young people that i work with that they were like we didn't vote for brexit we didn't vote for well scottish people didn't vote to young people didn't vote to stay in the united yeah. kingdom they wanted independence we didn't vote for david cameron no one voted for theresa may uh young people in the states didn't vote for trump like or we're going to be living with a legacy for this, so let's do a political book. For sure. And and also at the same time, you have like people in their forties writing um, hot takes about millennials all the time, and yeah. like millennials. And they're like in their fifties. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Like, they they don't have any, um, they don't have any agency to speak for themselves. Yeah. Well, they do, but like no one, no one like, no one gives them that platform. Mm. And that's really what the whole battle is about when you break it down into its simplest form it's just about giving people the voice that is theirs and not having other people talk on behalf for them and i think that's true from every industry you know it's not even exclusive or specific to the arts it's something that you find throughout the world is other groups of people the more dominant the more powerful talking on behalf of and most of the time getting it wrong you know yeah exactly and uh, you know as i said earlier I'm lucky enough to have a small platform at the moment and I just want to use it for good and 
uh, in the hope that you kind of empower the next generation and then they pay it forward because like the thing is like the people who I was lucky enough to have mentor me when I was at that stage of my career when I needed it I can't pay them back really I can buy them like buy them a pint, buy them a pint or yeah. a Kit Kat or yeah. something but um, the important thing is to pay it forward absolutely cool man thank you very much for chatting to me today bro and good oh, luck thank with you. all the rest of it thanks man thanks